I'm not trying to maximize profits in this. I'm just using it as a vehicle exactly, to yep. ride the volatility down that it's very predictable and familiar. Hey everyone, Lead Trainer with Stocks to Trade, Tim Bowen here, back with the Trader Spotlight. Um, interviewing a lot of upcoming traders and got one of my favorite here, um, a guy I met a couple years ago and got an incredible story. I, I really appreciate, you know, it's, it's a recurring theme in these interviews. There's so many young guys out there that have a great mindset, great work ethic, and then you're like, wow, they're doing well trading. I mean, there's not a coincidence there. So much of this is your mindset, your work ethic, and your, you know, addiction, I guess you could call it to this niche. And I think that is something that is one of the biggest takeaways that I could give you with these interviews. And today I've got Mike Huddy here, goes by Huddy, that's what that's what most of us call him for short. And uh, you know, a great up and coming trader with a great story. I, and one of my favorite stories out there. So welcome hey. back, Huddy. Nice Thanks for the introduction. Again, yeah. Honored to be called your favorite. <laughs> hey, it's the truth, it's the truth. So um, kind of give them a little bit of background. You know, you're a young guy, obviously. Uh, how old are you now? 24, turning 25 next month. Nice, nice, half as old as me. <laughs> you know, and, and this is something I talk about in a lot of these interviews. I mean, I wish I had these sorts of videos when I was 24 or 25 or 18 to see, you know, these guys this age. I mean, obviously the internet wasn't around when I was this age and even when I was 30, you know, this educational content wasn't out there. So, but it's uh, absolutely incredible the amount of stuff you can learn <laughs> online these days. I mean, the information is I mean, it's like I mean, my one of my favorite sites is YouTube, obviously we're on YouTube. I like Google. It, okay. <laughs> Google's going for me. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's just amazing like I mean, it's like growing plants or fixing your dryer or anything. It's just I mean, it's just, I, I, it's almost weird how you think back to the how did you even figure anything out in yeah, the past? I'm so, so glad to be born at the time I was born. I'm jealous. Very like fortunate. <laughs> So you've got an interesting story when it comes to trading. Um, you know, starting out, if you know, I, I don't want to answer for you, but I started. I think starting out with like a twenty dollar account or something yeah. like that. So what was the catalyst? You know, you're. you're I'm pretty sure you're in college at that time. Well, so what we, uh, what got you? What 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 made you think to okay, I want to go into trading or pursue it? So if so. we go back to the beginning of of what my journey is, yep, when I was in perfect. high school, let's go back to like eighteen. Uh, I was not the best high school student. I was one of those guys that. Thought I was, you know, I didn't take it seriously. Um, I was smart. I knew what to do. I just didn't do anything. Yep. And I was lazy and I didn't have a real similar bio. The similar bio. <laughs> and, I, and I find that to be truthful with most traders. You know, we're kind of like that part of the, the class that gets kind of shunned, but we're not, we're not stupid. We're not idiots, but we fell asleep and we just didn't take it seriously. And so graduating high school, I did not get accepted to college. Um, most colleges rejected me. Okay. So I had to find work elsewhere. And I ended up going into door-to-door -door sales. And the reason I bring this up is because I think in door-to-door -door sales, which is another one of those uh, industries where 90% of people fail. Sure. And it was another situation where I, this was a situation where I had to work hard and this was the first time I and had not, to. And not only do you fail at that career, you're failing, even if you succeed at that career, you're still failing daily. Yeah. You know, you're, you're not closing every sale. And so that's you, the thing, you know, it teaches you things about rejection yep. and how to like actually not make money for the day after days of hard work. And so, you know, that translates to trading years later where I'm okay with not making money for the day or taking a loss on the day because of what I learned in door-to-door -door sales. But the most important thing I learned was work ethic. Right. Um, being coachable, being teachable, how to, you know, mimic the best and have a mentor and actually use a mentor and utilize that appropriately. And I ended up breaking records for this company in the door-to-door -door sales uh, industry and I bring what that was all it? Up. What were you selling? Contracts. I mean, it's not much more interesting than that, but we okay. were selling electricity contracts. Oh, okay. Dang, I was and, hoping uh, it was vacuum cleaners. That no. would have been a cooler story. So. <laughs> yeah, I did. The, the intrinsics aren't great, but <laughs> the learning lesson of like, you know, the kind of mentality you sure. need and, you know, how to stay positive and keep like a, you know, winning mentality. And all that translates with me later into college and then into day trading as well. So I left door to door sales because I had, I had learned what I had learned and I didn't want to be a door to door salesman the rest of my life. Sure. Um, and so I went back and applied to college. And I didn't apply with my transcript, I applied with my resume. Okay. And I said, give me an interview, let me talk my way in because that's what I've been doing in door to door sales. Interesting, that's, that's, that's cool. Okay. So that's how I ended up at the University of San Francisco. And then I was making really good money when I was doing door to door sales. I mean, I ended up running my own office, I was the area manager, and at 19 I was making really good money. And when I got back into college, I lost that money. <laughs> and I was no longer being able to live the same life I was living. So it made me a little bit of an opportunity seeker. I was constantly looking for opportunity, constantly looking for ways to make money. And at the time I was an entrepreneurship major in college because 
I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I needed a piece of paper that said I was smart. Okay. That's what college is these days, pretty sure. much, in my opinion. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's, that led me back in college. And then two years in is when I found Sykes. Yep. It was um, 2015. Uh, I was just, uh, forget specifically, but I, my friend invited me to Robinhood. That's okay. right. All right. Okay. And uh, I Oh, booked, so he was doing the, you know, when you sign up for Robinhood, you get the affiliate thing, you get like five bucks. It was or back free when trade. it was a beta. Or, was, oh, okay. You know, 2015, okay. it was barely even, you know, open to the public. But he probably just dropped your email in because he knew your email. Or he was something. my roommate. He was okay. my roommate at the time. And he said, hey, uh, I got this app on my phone. It's called Robinhood and it allows you to trade stocks for free. There's no commissions. Yep. And I said, okay, send me it. I'd love okay. to just dabble. Sure. And this was the inception of stock trading. It's actually just, you know, this. Quick comment, it's crazy how life works like that. Sure. <laughs> where it's just, you know, small little events transpire into these great stories. Yep. Um, so he invited me to Robinhood. I put $20 into Robinhood, diversified it amongst many different stocks, <laughs> and whatever. At the end of the day, I made four cents. Sure. And from that moment, that's when the opportunity seeker in me came out. And I said, okay, what can I actually expect to make from investing in stocks? And they said the best people, the Ray Dalios, the Warren Buffetts, whatever, they make 30% a year. And I said, okay, if I'm going to beat the billionaires, I got to do better than 30% a year. 30% of my 20 bucks was six bucks. <laughs> and I said, that's, that's BS. Well, sure, sure. Yeah, you're never, yeah, never going to get where that. Yeah, yeah uh, yep. it's going to take years to just make yep. 20 bucks. Yep. And uh, that's ex with ex the expectation that I'm better than the billionaires. Yeah, exactly. So yep. it, was ne it nearly seemed impossible. Um, but I was still curious. So that's where I started looking into penny stocks because, again, it was this $20 account that I had. So I can only invest in penny stocks sure. at the moment. Yep, yep. You can't buy Amazon at $1,500 a share. Absolutely not. Yep. And so I started making stat sheets of penny stocks. And this is, you know, this is where my studying started. And for six months, I had about 150 stocks on a stat sheet. Now, were you doing this completely on your own? Yeah, Just, absolutely. Oh, interesting. Okay, opportunity right. seeker, looking for opportunity. Sure. Yep. And so I made 100. And people would see me in college. They'd be like, what are you doing? I was like, I don't know. I'm looking for something, and <laughs> right. I know I'm looking for something. And so I started making all these stat sheets, and I wasn't, I didn't know really what to, what to track. So I did open, low, high, close sure. every day. And if it closed green on the day, it was a highlighted green. And if it was red, it was highlighted red. 150 stocks for six months, and I just watched. And all of a sudden, I started seeing some outliers, some stocks that were really just blowing up out of the water. I mean, the first one I saw was VLTC when Carl Icahn bought in yep. at like you know, 50 cents or something like that. And then it ran to 22 within the next week or two. Yep. And I said, whoa, that's some real opportunity. That was a thousand percent. And if I can just nail a little bit of that, sure. then I can start making money. And I knew that I needed to find someone who knew what they were doing. So I started looking at Twitter and I found that people were in from the beginning. I right. found the Sykes, I found Gratani, I found people were trading this thing and writing it up and they knew what they, what they were doing. And that's when I found Sykes. Because um, once you start looking up penny stock trading, how, sure. to, how to trade VLTC, and then all the buzzwords started getting hit, and all of a sudden Tim Sykes preached a message. I saw a couple people, but Tim Sykes' message really resonated with me, okay. where it was yeah. um, trade to live the lifestyle that you want to live, have the freedom to travel and do the things that you want to do, and not have that nine to five, which right. you know, I already did the door to door sales, and I was kind of over the whole nine to five idea. I was into the entrepreneurship mindset. And so that's when I found Sykes, 2015. So now you kind of start your journey, um, and then you start training, you know, more actively. What uh, what were kind of what were the trip ups in the beginning? You know, obviously no one no one does it overnight. But what was what was the process then? You start learning. What were the ups and the downs from then on? Or from from that beginning stage, right? Because so, most people watching this, you know, this interview are going to be you know in the beginning stages, and maybe they're maybe they're profitable, maybe they're not, sure. but they're probably ser searching for this video because they're struggling. Right. You know? So it's still, it still gives me chills to even think about the beginning. Like, it's, it's tough. Sure. I mean, it's, you're, you're thrown into this like vast world of, of, you know, it's like a candy store and there's no one around to slap your hand and tell you that you can't eat the candy. Right. <laughs> and uh, so there's just all this information overload in the beginning. It's like you have to find out where you belong where you're going to find your consistency, where, where you resonate with and what makes sense with your personality. Yep. And so I just remember the beginning being such a confusing time in my life and just, you know, so much introspective reflection on just day to day activities. Um, and it, it took like, you know, a year or two, two and a half years uh, of trying everything. Yep. 
uh, and anything. And I was, uh, I was short selling, I was buying stocks, I was listening to one person, listening to another person, and I didn't have any real focus. And I think that's what really made my learning curve so far. Well, I, I mean, I agree, and I think that's a mistake all of us make, but I would also say a couple years isn't that bad either. Of course, because you know? <laughs> now I have a long-term perspective on it. Right, this. right, right. Um, but in the moment, it felt like a long time. Sure, and, and in the moment, years, a year feels like forever, and then you look back and it seems like nothing, but yeah. So I kind of forgot where I was at. Just kind of that growth process of going through those first couple years, listening to everybody, trying everything. So how did you find that thing that kind of actually worked? So what I realized was I was treating it like a hobby. Okay. And I wasn't treating it like a professional at the time. Right. And I realized that after two and a half years of trying this thing that I had a year left of college and I needed to buckle down or else I'm gonna have to get that nine to five job. Right. And I needed to stop going out on weeknights. I needed to stop showing up hungover. I needed to stop poking around like it was Monopoly money. Yep. I needed to focus and find I needed to find consistency. I right. needed to make this work. And that whole mind shift was huge. Uh, it, it became no longer that this number on a screen. It became I started treating it like it was real. And you think that you think just kind of that graduation date is what made that difference or graduation date and also for two and a half years, you know, just seeing it all and knowing that I was there, but okay. also knowing that it was myself that I was that was defeating me. Right. It wasn't like the patterns weren't working. It was that I was too all over the place to be focused on what was working. Okay. Um, you know, you have to first learn what not to do in order to not lose. Right. Then you can start to win. So I had to learn where I was losing and I couldn't do that when I was so scattered. Okay. So yeah, it was, it was a culmination of things. Uh, and then that whole mind shift told me to re-scrap everything. Start from fresh and I looked at my stats, I looked at my profit lease stats and it said that I had made $18,000 or whatever short selling and that I was losing on my longs. Okay. So in my head, I learned where I was losing, longs. Right. Right. And then this, so I said, I'm not gonna long anymore and I'm gonna go back to my material and study the best again. So that's when I rehashed, you know, Gritani and Sykes and different videos, but specifically Gritani. Yep. And I just re-put in all the hours. I re-watched his DVD that I've already watched, you know, four or five times. Right. <laughs> watched the six time, two and a half years in. Bookmarked all of his webinars, re-watched all, watched all of his webinars, first of all, for the first time. Okay. And that put me in the right headspace where I was only gonna short sell. Yep. And that was huge for me. That was where I found consistency and that was a big defining moment. I then went and got the right broker to be able to short sell. I found that many times I would have this great short pattern that I wanna attack. Sure. I didn't have the shares to short it. And then instead of watching that play all the way through, I would then go look at other things and try to trade something else because I had a plan and it's working perfectly and I wasn't able to trade it. Right. So then again, me defeating myself. Which is frustrating. You right. see, see missed profits and then you're like, well, I'm gonna try and make it up over here. And you so, see other people making money elsewhere. Exactly, yep. And then you start looking at the chats and all of a sudden you have five different tickers on your screen. <laughs> you're not watching the play that you were prepared for and then you're in one of the, hopefully just one, but sometimes three or five of the sure. tickers, right? Yep. And uh, so yeah, it was again about focus. Um, lost my thought again. No, no, you're fine. So we're talking about, you know, as you're refining that strategy, focusing on short selling. And, you know, why do you think, and, and this might be a tough question for you, but why do you, why do you think that works for you? Or, or you know, is it, is it a, just kind of the way you think? Or Because I get asked all the time, people are like, well, what's my strategy? I'm saying they're asking me. I'm yeah. like, well, you kind of got to try everything and see what works for you. Why do you think shorting, you know, big hyped up stocks works for you best. So I, I think one thing that I really resonated with was first of all, the way that Gritani would, would, would teach. And yep. I, it was very understandable for me and I really resonated with that. Yep. Um, another thing is I think the strategy fit the this, this schedule that I had as a college student okay. where a lot of the morning panics that I ended up becoming very consistent with would happen in that first 30 minutes to an hour of the morning. Which you're at this point, West Coast time, right? I'm at this point, it's, I'm a senior, I'm a double major in finance and economics, West Coast time. And so mornings are tough. Mornings right? are tough, but that's yeah. the only time I could trade. <laughs> right, right. So 6.30 to 8.30 was my small window. And I couldn't look at afternoon breakout buys. I couldn't look at holding something and seeing where it went. Okay. I had to make very predictable, familiar nail and bail moves. Okay. And so I gravitated towards the overextended gap down, the first red day type shorts, because that's what I was able to trade with my schedule. Yep, yep. Um, and it became, like I said, it's a nail and bail. It was, you know, short wherever I shorted. And those plunges were generally really extreme if you're watching the right stock and the right pattern. Right. And I could, I didn't have to try to maximize profits. All I had to do was try to make money for the day, close a laptop, go to the gym, go to class. Yep. And so that's kind of what, Attract, that's that's how I found short selling. That's how I found where I belonged. Okay. 
Um, and you know, and I think that's a great mind. A couple couple things there that I want to focus on is that time of day and personal schedule type thing. Something I talk about all the time. Sykes talks about all the time. I mean, I think t- Sykes has an entire instructional DVD strictly based on time of <laughs> I day. Think he does. I, yeah. So, but but it's an important thing, and, and that's something you need to recognize if you've got that job, if you've got school, if you got both. You know, if you can trade in the morning, you got to find setups that work in the morning. If you can only trade in the afternoon, focus on setups that work in the afternoon because stuff that works in the morning doesn't work in the afternoon and vice versa. And don't discount that value, that that kind of time of day type thing. So um, back to back to setups, I want to talk about this because people hear these you know, these terms, these abbreviations that we all use. Sure. So a couple couple you mentioned was, you know, that overextended gap down, you know, that first red day. Kind of explain to me, you know, because I, I want people to be able to maybe apply some of this. You know, when you say overextended gap down, you know, that's three words or two words, I guess, <laughs> for a setup. Explain what is an overextended gap so down. So a lot of the setup, a lot of the short sales that I make revolve around that first red day where yeah. You have a stock that you know it's had a lot of extension, and it's got multiple green days in a row of just you know going off of a base of wherever, and it's that first time that it's red on the day. Yep. And so this is a, this is a stock that's been green three, four, five, six or more days in a row. Up hundreds of percent yep, points. Yep. Yep. And then now, are you looking for for entry? Are you looking for that you know that that what we call that big parabolic candle? For that, you know, for that blow off top type idea, or are you just looking for steady up trending action? You so. know, a lot, of, a lot of it is case by case, but generally, okay, like, I don't like grinding action. Yeah, I don't exactly. want like That's I want volatility, I <laughs> yeah. right? I want people who think they're right and all of a sudden are wrong really bad. There, well said. That's where yeah. I'm gonna make yep. some money. Yep. Um, just the price inefficiency. Um, but so all my shorts, they they revolve around that first red day after massive extension because there's a lot of good reason as to why that day is gonna be covered in selling action, or at least there's not gonna be very many buyers. Yep. And so it's more than just a candlestick chart at that point. Now it's, I have a good reason as to why, whether I'm shorting bounces on a first red day or it's an overextended gap down type setup or it's going red for the first time. It's amongst that first red day where I think people don't want to buy this stock because it's already extended off a of base for multiple yep. days. It doesn't make a lot of sense to right. make a responsible decision. Um, clearly the price is inefficient right now. So not a lot of buyers. Um, if you were long during the run-up, you're now a seller, right. and that first time it's red is a huge trend change. Yep. This is the first time that it's red on the day. And longs know that, and they know that they need to get out of their position. So that's another area of selling pressure. Um, so there's no buyers, there's a bunch of longs selling their positions, and then there's the short sellers, yep. who know as well to start attacking on this day. So that's a lot of selling, and there's no one buying. Right. So it puts the probabilities and the odds of me taking a short on that day at some point heavily in my favor. And that's what I like. It's like, you know, on a first green day, which a lot of people like to short for whatever reason, they see this massive <laughs> gap and crap thing. Right. And I hate that. Yeah. I can't <laughs> short on first green days right. because that's a day where it should be covered in massive amount of buying. Yep. Because if shorts are getting squeezed, they're buyers. If people believe in the news, they're buyers. If people just want to buy something, it's a first green day gapping up, they're buyers. And yep. that's the opposite of my situation. Now there's three buyers and one seller. Well said. Yeah. And yep. I'll get blown out of the water. So I found where where it's most safe, in my opinion, to be in terms of not getting blown out of the water, yep. which is that day where there's much more selling than, it, logically, there's much more selling than buying. Yeah, and, and well said, and that, you know, so that idea, you know, that gradually uptrending stock, that it's green, 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 and then that first day that it's red, you know, most of these stocks, they're gapping up in the morning, you know, may, maybe 1%, maybe more, but it's green on the day. So when, when we talk about these terms, a stock that's green on the day is above the previous day's close. So a lot of these, they gap up, they slowly grind higher, they close near the high of the day, they repeat that day after day. And now what you're looking for is that first red day, that day that this stock doesn't gap up. Maybe it gaps down, maybe it opens flat, and then it starts to fade. Below the previous day's close. Exactly, and the point that he made that is a great point is, I mean, he's just joining the trend. He's selling when everybody's selling, because what you wanna do is think about that mindset. If you bought four days ago, three days ago, two days ago, or a day ago, in theory, you're green. You're, you're you're up on this trade. So now, when you see then and you know this this trend change, you're just taking profits. It's not like, you know, it's not like you uh, you think the stock is going to zero. You're like, hey, I rode this up. I'm taking profits, so I'm going to sell. So you're selling as that short seller, as you're selling first before you buy back. You're joining the trend. Selling begets selling. The more selling there is, and as the other great point he made is. Who's buying on a stock that's up 
12 days right. in a row, you know. I mean, sure, somebody is. Somebody's buying. But, I mean, it's only the complete, you know, I hate the term, but the noobs or, you know, or somebody that's the only people buying on the 12th green day are completely clueless. Well, they just don't know what they're doing yet. Yeah, exactly. And that's just going to be a small percentage. So you're joining that trend, selling baguettes selling we see that you know it's like you see, you see it and, and, and they just you know the because the, everybody's joining in and that's what makes it such a high probability set and, so. and it's good that you're a lot of the things you said i'm not trying to maximize profits in this i'm just using it as a vehicle exactly to yep. ride the volatility down that is very predictable and familiar yep and so everyone's like every, a lot of people ask me more importantly is like where do i cover yep well once i see that move happen and i've, I've made money it, it I'm not trying to like say that this company is going all the way back down right. from where it came from. I'm just saying that this is a very predictable day to be short. And that's where I found consistency. Yep. And, and on that point, so that's a great point. So most of what you're looking at, and I, I don't want to answer, I'll let you answer, but okay. you know, it's more of a technical standpoint. You know, you're not looking at the financials. You mentioned you don't think the stock's going to zero. So you're just looking at a trend change. Selling, you know, again, mostly a technical versus a fundamental type approach. In the beginning, absolutely. Okay. Now we're, you know, four or five years in, and I'm starting to progress within my small niche, my small home. You know, what makes one first red day worse than the other first okay. red day? And how can I build a thesis and a conviction in my head to maybe take bigger size or maybe be more patient? Right. Can I find reason more than just the candlesticks? Okay. Um, and so that's where I've kind of taken it now into the progression where, yeah, I am looking through the filings. I do have a process to find the crappiest of the crap. And I may want to be more patient with that one. Um, now that I am like a full-time trader, I, I do look for more edge. So, so that's, a, and that's another very common question. So what are you looking for? You know, on those fundamentals, you know, what, what do you, you know, when you mention the, the filings, the news, the financials, et cetera, kind of, kind of what take me, you know, it's a hypothetical, but kind of take me into a, a, a potential idea. So the idea is I want to find, like I was saying earlier, more sellers than buyers. Yep. Where can there be more overhead supply, potential areas of disasters for longs? Sure. And within the filings, you can find things like dilution, which is the process of a company taking freshly minted shares and dumping them onto retail traders. So if a stock has, and maybe this might be too technical, but if a stock has a million shares outstanding and they dilute with another million shares, now there's two million shares outstanding, but there's f a fresh amount of a million people yep. where were they just sold all that dilution into. So that's a lot more sellers now at that point. And it adds to, um, you know, when that first red day comes, there should be a lot more selling happening than buying. Yep. And so that's what I've kind of taken it into now where it's like, I don't want to trade every single first red day because I'm trading too much. Okay. And I'm a big proponent on trading less. Perfect. <laughs> um, I used to trade a lot. And now that's not what it's about. It's about not trading. And I'm, unless I absolutely have to because it looks so perfect. Right. And I'm finding you know there are scenarios where when I can piece together the full puzzle and be detective about it, that leads to much bigger percent wins, that leads to much higher conviction, and honestly, it just led to consistency. Okay. Um, finding the right stocks to actually short because of knowing how much overhead supply there was. Okay. Now that's something something you said that you, is, is, is I'm sure a lot of people are kind of the antenna to go up. So you're saying trading less is better. You know, yeah. most people are going to say, well, if you can make a hundred bucks on one trade, why wouldn't you trade ten times a day? So so explain that explain that less what it means to you that that less is more. So I, I, you know, it, and it, and it took me a while to realize that because I used to try to do that. I used to yep. try to even when we I found all consistency. Did, all been there. Yeah. You know, I still wanted to hit it multiple times. I still wanted to trade multiple stocks and make as much money. But it's not about frequency of winning. It's about frequency of not losing. Right. <laughs> and I find that you know once you start making money on the day, you start getting into your emotions and maybe. You have a gain and then you don't want to risk the house money or you want to only risk house money. Yep. So maybe you've made $500 and you get into another trade where you're risking Which that, that 500. Which that saying drives me nuts because it's, it's like everybody that says that seems to end up like break even on the day. Exactly. Because all they do is get back. You know, It's like, oh, I'm only risking house money. And then at the end of the day, they're flat or they're down. And I'm like, yeah. That wasn't house's money. That was your money. Right. That was, you know? that was, your, that was your money for the day. <laughs> yeah. And that was your bills. Um, and then on top of that, it's like, a lot of the times when you're getting into multiple plays on the day, unless you're really experienced, you're probably making those ideas up on the fly. Yep. And there's gonna be some emotions involved. And so I found that the more times that I kind of dipped my finger back into the candy store, I would get a little burnt for it. Yep. And so it, it got to the point where I just wanted modest goals. I just wanted to come into the market, make my money on my predictable move yep. and get out and then do what I actually set out to do. Not sit in front of the laptop for six, eight hours, trying to maximize as much money as I have, but I'm just trying to make my predictable money and then go live my life. Yep. 
um, progress elsewhere, you know, create businesses, work out, you know, eat well and research and do the things that I originally set out to do back in 2015. Yeah, yeah. So I, think, I figure, yeah, go ahead. Well, I would just, you know, that that's a, and that's the way I approach trading as well. Is it, it drives me nuts when people, you know, um, they, they say, I want to escape the nine to five. I want to ex escape the daily grind. Yeah. And I'm like, and then, okay, all you do is sit here at a laptop at 15, 15 hours a day. I'm like, yeah. okay, yeah, you're at home. That's great, you're at home. But it's like, what's the point of sitting here for all day long trying to squeak out another profit when you already made that money in the morning. Or, and it's not necessarily or, or maybe great. you're an afternoon trader. Why why be there in the morning right. if you're an afternoon trader? I mean, the whole reason brings me to this, and I think you too, was the idea of the freedom. Yeah. You know? I don't want to sit here hunched over a laptop 12 hours a day. And the freedom's so. amazing. You know, I, I, just to you know touch on the freedom, I just got back from traveling yep. all summer long. And I didn't even open up, I opened up my laptop maybe twice in three months. Yep. Because I knew the summer months were slow. I know that summer months are generally not months that you know you're going to miss the most amazing opportunity. And I was able to you know say I worked really well this year. I already made I had made 100k from January to May. Beautiful. And uh, I didn't need to trade anymore. Yep. I didn't need to make more money. There's not there's not this itch where you know it's it's almost like degenerative where yeah. it's like you're an, you're an addict. <laughs> well, that's that gambler mindset, and that's why so many fail. Is they you know it's like it's just it's the so many people are you're approaching it like a professional. You know, you're approaching it like this is something that I recognize that can make me money. You're not approaching it as someone that wants action on the day. Exactly. You know, it's like, so, for a while I wanted the action. It, it, yep. And again, been there, done that. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> but then you realize the action just, you know, it's debilitating almost. Yep. yep. And uh, well, yeah, you end up like a freaking addict at some point. Yeah. And, it, and it really does <laughs> suck when you, when you make $500 a day and then you get into four or five more trades and you dwindle that 500. Even if you don't lose it all, it just mentally, it, 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 it handicaps you, not only because you lose your money, but you also don't know where your consistency lies. Because yep. how can you review all those trades and how can you review which one that you should only trade? Right. When you have five or six and maybe you know one's a multi-day runner dip buy, maybe one's a dip buy on an OTC panic, maybe one's a different dip buy that you just you know followed someone on Twitter. Who knows, but you contaminate your mind when you trade so much yep. that you really need to just narrow it down and focus within within what you know. Now to kind of wrap up, um, kind of going back to a little bit earlier, First of all, I'm still amazed by your progress in a couple of years, what you've accomplished. Thank you. But the one takeaway I kind of get is exactly that. To the, to the person viewing, listening, do you think that would be the one big takeaway is, is go back to Huddy in 2015 and just look at one setup at a time, test this, actually keep track of what you're doing. Do you think, and again, I'm impressed with your results, do you think that could have shortened maybe your journey a little bit by yeah. being a little more focused? Absolutely. If okay. I was if I was more focused and organized and and yeah, it, and again, it goes back to the needing the action back then. Right. And I was trading all over the place. Where you know, to date, that's why I said when we started, like it gives me chills to think of the beginning, <laughs> because I was an absolute gambler. People yep. say is stock trading gambling, and yes, it is to some extent. But when you actually hone your craft, you know what you're doing. Then what makes me any different than a big time investor? Yep. Right. I I know where I can actually make money. Um, back then, that wasn't the case at all. It was poking around like Monopoly money. Right. <laughs> and that's what led to one step forward, one and a half steps back for way too long. Yep. I mean, it didn't have to take two and a half years, but it took two and a half years for me to come to the realization. Yep, yep. So, well, again, thanks a lot, honey. Absolutely. Um, great work. And again, you know, I think uh, um, I look back at, you know, I, I know I already mentioned it, but, you know, the, the time, I mean, it's just a couple years. I mean, I know a lot of great traders out there. I've interviewed a lot of them. I, I know a lot of them through the years being around this for 13 years, but sure. still, man, two years is nothing. And it's so impressive, man. Yeah, I'm and, excited and, to see where it goes. Yeah, exactly. Me too. And, uh, you know, and to, to the viewer out there, I mean, if you're struggling six months, a year, two years in, just, you know, the number one thing is stay in the game, keep grinding, keep showing up every day. And really, as the biggest takeaway I think from Huddy is, you know, is, is try and focus as much as you can. Now, I know it's hard when you're getting started, when there's so much information yeah. coming at you, but drill down, name your setups, and track them, and see what works for you. And sometimes you'll be surprised. You might think something that is, you might think it is working, and it's not working. But the biggest way to do that is to do as little as possible Keep things simple and track that data. And it's also, you know, long-term goals. This yep. isn't a sprint. It's yes. a marathon. And like, you know, day by day, try not to focus on that. Try to focus on week by week, month yes. by month, year by year. Like have that extended view of how long you want to take this. 
Um, you know, because every day, whether it's a good trade or a bad trade, can get wiped out the next day. Yes. Yep. So focus on your process. And and I think that the great great way to wrap it up. I think uh, you know I think you're probably share the same. I mean, uh, I plan on trading. 10 years from now, 20 years, 50 yeah. years from now, 80 years from now. And keep that in mind. You know, you know, no matter how old you are. Market's you can, not going anywhere. Exactly. You could be 60 years old and you might have 30, 40 years left to trade. Have that long mindset. Have those good goals. All right. Cool. Nice work, man. Thank you. Thanks for watching our video. Be sure to comment below with any trading related question. We love answering your questions. Also, like and share with your friends and be sure to subscribe to be notified as soon as our next video hits. And if you're looking to expand your trading knowledge, don't forget to check out all of our other videos and be sure to click the trial below. Check out Stocks to Trade. I think it is one of the best, most rapidly advancing softwares out there. Be sure to check out our trial.